I can't hear you. Good afternoon. That's much better. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Dr. Kwame Anderson, and I am the Vice President of the Programs Department at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And it gives me great pleasure to stand before you today. Uh, this health and wellness luncheon was a vision a few months ago, and on today it's coming to pass. So I hope that the speakers that are here today will impart some wisdom and knowledge that each of you can take back to your communities and find useful. And at this time, I would like to acknowledge my president, my illustrious president and CEO, Ms. A. Shawnice Washington, who will welcome and introduce uh, our chairwoman, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you so much. Please welcome her to the stage. You can do better than that. Let's welcome her. Warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Anderson, and good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's 47th Annual Legislative Conference. We have labored to bring you the best experts to impart knowledge that you can take back to the communities you represent across this great nation, and hopefully you will gain insight that is both useful and practical. The Health and Wellness Luncheon has become a popular forum that has a unique following. We are delighted you have joined us in today's discussion on African American participation in clinical trials, challenging the gold standard. I want to thank our sponsors for their con continued support of the CBCF. Without you, we would not be able to support health programming to the communities we serve. To our title sponsor and the entire Bristol Myers Squibb team, thank you. Pleasure meeting you earlier. And we look forward to continuing and strengthening our partnership. Uh, also would like to acknowledge uh, Ohio Health Foundation as well as Eli Lilly. We are grateful to you as well for your sponsorship as we build upon um, our relationship. Even before the Tuskegee study ended in 1972, there was a dark history of African American exploitation and medical research. For centuries, African Americans have held a universal distrust of the medical community. For this reason, many of our brothers and sisters are not participating in clinical trials. Unfortunately, this has a negative impact on our communities, resulting in medication that may not be as safe nor as effective as its intended outcome. I applaud each of you for coming together to have this sensitive yet necessary dialogue. We must remain at the forefront of cutting edge research so that there is diversity in clinical research that is representative of our unique communities and we must work collectively to move more African Americans towards preventive medication, medicine versus that sick tertiary care. There is potential harm in excluding women and minorities and non-scalable numbers from medication research. Distrust aside, our participation in clinical trials can provide real-time data on how minorities respond to pharmaceutical drugs to combat diseases ranging anywhere from diabetes to schizophrenia. I invite each of you to challenge the gold standard by dispelling myths and encouraging those around you to become involved by participating in clinical trials. In doing so, we strengthen our communities with the hopes of better health outcomes and overall quality of life. Thank you all so very much, and I do hope that you enjoy the rest of your time with us this week at our 47th Annual Legislative Conference. And it is now my pleasure to bring to the podium our esteemed and illustrious chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Board of Directors, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you, thank you. Sparkling. We are so glad you're here. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, that's not loud enough. We know how to do the amen refrain. Then I'll just say amen. Amen. 
Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I can tell that you're eating healthy. I am delighted to be part of the health and wellness luncheon. And let me thank Dr. Kwame Anderson and as well all of the staff. Give our big, very big hand. It is my uh, privilege to be able to thank and wel welcome all of you uh, and to acknowledge the importance of this luncheon and the importance of good health and wellness uh, in uh, this nation, and particularly for African Americans. I want to particularly thank Bristol Myers Squibb. Let's give them a very big hand for supporting this health and wellness luncheon from the policy perspective and a global policy advocacy um, who is um, uh, the um, person who is representing us. I want to thank them very much for their uh, being here. Um, and as well, and I just, I'm looking for uh, Dr. Diarro. Dr. Diarro? All right, I'm looking for you. Let's give you applause again. I know you'll be coming up. I thought you were on stage. Give Dr. Diarro a very big hand. He'll be speaking shortly. And then I want to acknowledge uh, the uh, moderator who is our dear friend, and that is Congresswoman uh, Donna Christian Christensen, who was a major orchestrator of the Affordable Care Act and continues to stay on the battle of health care. Give her a very big hand. So my message uh, to you is that you're in the right place at the right time. Yesterday, the Senate introduced legislation that takes us down the thorny path of eliminating our right to access uh, to medical care by cutting Medicaid, eliminating the waiver or the um, acceptance of pre-existing condition and still allow you to get insurance uh, and cutting millions of dollars, billions of dollars from Medicaid uh, and of course ending uh, the lifetime uh, opportunity to receive health care by putting back in place caps, lifetime caps. So now you will have that. That is not good health care, is it? Is that good health care? No. Is that wellness? No. And so as you uh, lunch today, as you listen to these experts, join the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and ensure that we will be the policy advocates along with the Congressional Black Caucus to stand in the gap, continue the trend and the trajectory of what we started on, where more people are healthy, more minorities are healthy, more disabled have access to health care, more mental health services are available, and if I can sense who is in this room, we are not going back. We will not go back. And so I'm delighted to welcome you all, and as well, to on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, indicate to you that we will continue to stand in the gap with you. Thank you so very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is the second time in my career that I follow the uh, horrible uh, representative Sheila Jackson Lee. Um, last time was uh, about 15 years ago at the Texas Children's Hospital, and she may not remember, I had more hair than now. And I must say that she has sustained the length of time much better than I did. Uh, it was also a pleasure to see uh, David Satter earlier on, uh, we've been together in the old days of the struggle against HIV AIDS, uh, which has disproportionately affected our community, as you know. Um, so thank you for joining this uh, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Health and Wellness Luncheon. Um, my name is Amadou Diara. I'm heading global policy, advocacy, and government affairs for Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, my company, is a biopharmaceutical company focused on discovering, developing, and delivering innovative medicines to help patients prevail against serious illnesses. Uh, my colleagues sat at the table on the left uh, and myself are really proud to sponsor this health and wellness luncheon. Uh, and we look forward to robust conversations on the important topic of diversity in clinical trials. I cannot help but remember what I heard from an African-American uh, researcher, a clinician at a cancer center, 
recounting what he was telling patients to reassure them. He would not do anything to them that he would not recommend for his own mother. That was the extent that he had to reassure patients to want to get involved in clinical trials. Um, before I hand over back to our distinguished moderator, I wanted to flag um, two colleagues at the Bristol Myers Group table, and I will ask them to stand. Uh, David Gonzalez, who's heading diversity and inclusion at Bristol Myers Group. Um, and I'm sure many of you in the room uh, know David. He has been around. Uh, he's a builder, and he has done great contributions in our company for diversity and inclusion. And the next person I want to introduce is Adrian Gonzalez. They have nothing related, although they carry the same last name, but uh, <laughs> just to reassure everybody. Now, I, I would like to call Adrian a CEO, a chief executive officer, although it's not her real title at our company, but she has a very unique position in the sense that she leads what we call the Black Organization for Leadership and Development. This is a group of over 500 people who are not only originated from the US, we have membership in Brazil and other countries, and I want to pay tribute to the extraordinary work that Adrian is uh, doing. Um, BOLD, the Black Organization for Leadership and Development, is focused on developing the next leaders in the African-American community and making sure that at Bristol Myers Squibb we leverage better uh, the cultural diversity coming from the African-American um, uh, folks. It's also about community involvement and her group has been very instrumental in making the issue of diversity in clinical trials progress at Bristol Myers Squibb. So I would encourage you to touch base with her. Her powers are almost unlimited, and um, I would like to thank her once again here. Um, before I close and hand over to our distinguished moderator, I would like to uh, paraphrase a good friend of mine who is the CEO of uh, the Executive Leadership Council, uh, Ron Parker, that some of you know. If not now, when? If not us, who? Thank you very much. And I would like now to call uh, Dr. Kwame Anderson to take over from here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, did you want to say something else? I wanted to do an intervention for a minute. OK. Um, we talk about health and wellness, but she will be on your second panel. And she'll tell her own story, but I just want to acknowledge uh, a very, a, 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 like a sister to me. Our families were very close. Lorenita Lucas. Um, and Dr. Satch, how are you? I'm too short. I did not see you right there. I'll come and shake your hand. But uh, Lorenita Lucas will tell her story. Um, she is actively battling uh, cancer. And she is out today with us to tell her story. Uh, and as well to share her victory, because I'm going to claim for her victory, proclaim for her victory. Um, so if you just stand again, you just got seated. If someone can, uh, you can, there you are. Thank you. Give her a rousing applause, please. She has come today in spite of. Listen to her story and be part of her fight. Love you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for allowing me the intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Um, how many of you have been to this luncheon before? Good. So I didn't think Kwame needed to introduce me since I've been here for every single one of them. So I'm Donna Christensen, the former Congresswoman and former chair of the Health Brain Trust of the Congressional Black Caucus. And it's my pleasure to welcome you and to welcome our panelists for what I know will be a very stimulating discussion. I for this morning, I was with the National Medical Association, and their keynote speaker before I left was the new Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams. And I bring you a message from him in the, in, as part of his remarks. He encouraged us to get involved in clinical trials. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about, tomorrow at our session in the afternoon, we'll be talking about precision medicine which is a new state of the art that is where medicine is going. 
It's treatment based on you specifically, personalized medicine, using your own cells and your own genetic makeup. To me, as we ask how we can, it can be used to re reduce disparities tomorrow, this discussion today is really paramount. Because if we can't address the issues of us being involved in clinical trials, we will never be able to take advantage of all of the state-of-the-art medicine that's coming to us very, very soon. Actually, it's here already. And so I want to be very brief because we have some really outstanding panel, panelists. We're going to make this a very interactive discussion. I'm going to ask one question of each of the panelists. They're going to have about four minutes to answer. And we're going to open it up to the audience. So as you listen to the, um, in the panelists speak, formulate your questions and be ready because we've got a really short window here uh, this afternoon. So our first speaker, and I'm going to introduce them as, they, as, as I pose the question to them. Our first speaker, we're really very fortunate to have Dr. Eliseo Perez-Stabler. He is the director of the National Institute of Health's National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, an institute that many of you in this room worked very hard to see established. His research has included improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved populations, advancing patient-centered care, improving cross-cultural communication skills among clinicians, and producing, promoting diversity in the biomedical research uh, workforce. You have the rest of his bio, and I'm going to invite Dr. Perez Stabla to present to, to answer this first question. I'm, I'm, still in my last panel. <laughs> okay, so it had to be more than 10 years ago at a National Medical Association meeting where I was on a panel with several physicians. Dr. Satcher may have even been one of them talking about the need for African Americans to become involved in clinical trials. And here we are many years later and we're still having to have this very critical discussion today. So can you give us an idea of what steps, initiatives, or programs that NIH might have to help us advance this issue? And what success have you achieved? What, what kind of success are you seeing? Yes, gladly. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Christensen, and uh, uh, welcome from NIH for everyone here. It's really an honor to, uh, to be able to be on this panel with you today. So first of all, we're mandated by law to sort of track in what we call inclusion, and it's both by gender and race ethnicity. And so since the early 90s, this has been ongoing at NIH, and it is a challenge. However, I will say that we have made a fair amount of progress o over this period of time. If we look at our statistics over the last five years, about 12 to 11 to 12 percent of all NIH um, studies that involve human beings, clinical studies, uh, are, the participants are African Americans. And if we only look at the phase three clinical trials, which is a certain early onset or mid-clinical mid trial, it's about 22 percent. And that number has actually increased substantially in the last five years. So I do think we, we've made progress. We, we still need to do a lot more. What we do at NIH is monitor uh, and require the scientists, the principal investigators, uh, to actually report on their progress. And our role and one of my responsibilities as uh, NIMHD director, working with other directors and with Hannah Valentine at NIH, is to make sure that this, there is accountability on the part of the investigators. A lot of times scientists will say, I'm going to do this, but then we don't ever really follow up and check that they actually were able to do it. But let me address a couple of issues that I think we've learned over time. Sometimes scientists say, Give, tell me what to do and I'll go out and do it. And there really is hard to come up with an empirically based sort of formula to say, this is what you need to do to get more minorities and more African Americans into clinical studies. But there are some issues we have learned. First of all, there is an enormous amount of mistrust that exists in the general public 
that is higher rates of mistrust in all minority groups, and African Americans in particular. Some of this relates to Tuskegee, and others relates to just mistrust of institutions. We've made progress in that area as well. And one of the components that seems to matter a lot is to have the physician, the primary physician, in charge of the care of that patient to recommend engagement or involvement in a, in a clinical research study. So obviously one intervention would say, well, let's get more diversity in our workforce, and that will help get more uh, African-American physicians out there, more minority physicians out there in general, and that may make a difference. We haven't studied this, but this would be an area I think that could potentially make a difference. Um, the other question is, why do it? So some say, why, why do we need to have minorities in studies? Why can't we just figure it out on whoever volunteers? First of all, if the demo demographics of the country have evolved, we should have our clinical participants look like the demographics. So some common sense social justice. Second, it's good science. We have made discoveries of issues, and this is probably different from 10 years ago. It's now obvious that if we don't have diversity in our clinical participants, we're going to miss stuff. We're going to miss discovery of genetic, uh, environmental interactions, drug efficacy in certain groups and not in others. There are a number of examples now of this published in, in high-profile uh, medical journals. And I think that's, I think, the answer that needs to go to all the scientists. We need to do this because of science as well as social justice and common sense. Um, so I'll refer everyone to visit clinicaltrials.gov where all uh, studies that are funded by NIH that are clinical trials are registered and where most uh, clinical trials are registered. You can sort of see a menu there of things that are, that are funded. And, and then uh, also because the um, uh, pharmaceutical industry also funds and supports a lot of clinical studies, I think this is not just a, an NIH issue. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's given you a good idea of what's happening at NIH, and, and actually I'm glad to hear that we're making yes. progress. Um, our, our next speaker is Dr. Edwin Chapman, Sr. He is the Chief Medical Officer of Medical Home Development Group, a multi-specialty physician-led, physician-owned medical service organization headquartered here in Washington, D.C. He currently collaborates with Howard University and as a, is an adjunct professor there as well. Um, he's, his pro primary area is in behavioral health and psychiatry and investigating a complex mix of addiction, un undertreated mental illness, infectious disease, such as AIDS and hepatitis C, criminal behavior and chronic diseases, and the rest of his bio is there. I. Um, Dr. Puckman was going to talk about Bital, and I'm, you can bring it. Many of us have had this experience of working with a drug where there was a small segment of African Americans in a trial. The trial was thrown out, it wasn't successful, and they looked back at those um, African Americans that were in the trial and found that this particular medicine worked very well, but it only worked in African Americans. And several of us on these panels have been involved in that. Now, you're a practicing physician, you're in the addiction area. And can you tell us a, a bit about your experience on the effectiveness or the lack of effectiveness of medicines in our population, especially as you've seen it in a health crisis that's very much a hot topic today, the opioid crisis? You can speak there, you can speak here. Oh, you have slides. Okay. You have, you have the clicker? Uh, yeah. Certainly an honor to be here uh, for the second year in a row. Um, the slides that I'm going to present, and it's interesting, uh, with Bideal, uh, I was actually, I'm, I'm actually not a psychiatrist. I want to get that out of the way. I'm an internist, and I did a fellowship in cardiology at Howard. And at that time, about 40 years ago, I think, uh, we were using a pre um, hydralazine and nitroglycerin uh, separately and uh, thought that there was a separate mechanism. It subsequently became a single uh, pill uh, called Bideal that uh, 
was commercially available, but we actually knew that high doses of hydralazine and nitroglycerin uh, worked in our patients. We didn't know that there was something different because we were seeing all African-American patients for the most part at Howard. So, so this is my second bite at the apple. Uh, I actually went back to Howard uh, four years ago uh, to combine internal medicine, psychiatry, and substance abuse. For the past 17 years, I've been involved in substance abuse treatment. So uh, what we're showing here uh, uh, is my experience in both uh, um, use, the use of methadone and buprenorphine, two replacement medications that are used uh, uh, primarily for opioid addiction. Uh, so what challenges do minority patients face with medication efficacy and opioid treatment? Uh, well, the first thing is access to care, and we are all very familiar with that. And we can uh, also dispel the myth that the opioid addiction uh, uh, is not impacting the African-American community. Uh, this is Washington, D.C. last year. For the first year, uh, overdoses from opioids exceeded the homicide rate. And with the projection this year, uh, that would uh, uh, exceed again by another 30 percent this year. So already we've had 150 documented uh, opioid overdoses in the District of Columbia. So the three medications are buprenorphine, methadone, and Vivitrol. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, buprenorphine and methadone primarily. These are replacement therapies. And uh, I, I want to warn you that 90 percent of uh, folks who are actually addicted to opioids uh, will relapse without medication. So medication, just like for diabetes, for hypertension, uh, for opioid addiction, 90% of patients are going to need uh, medication. Jail is not the answer. Uh, residential treatment uh, often fails uh, uh, because of that. Now, what we found was that uh, if you look at this slide, these are multiple states. And what you're seeing in red are the maximum doses allowed for buprenorphine in, in various states across the country. They also limit treatment uh, up to one year or two years in many cases, and they use the insurance company and farm benefits to do that. So what I was seeing in my patient population was that, that the patients needed higher doses, certainly than 8 milligrams, 16 milligrams, and many needed more than 24 milligrams. Uh, ironically, at Johns Hopkins, there were two doctors there who noticed the same thing, but the state of Maryland forcibly reduced the maximum dose of medication from uh, those above uh, uh, 16 milligrams, uh, 24 milligrams, down to 16 milligrams. And they reported it uh, in that uh, it did harm and patients were relapsing. Uh, now, this is uh, uh, an article out of uh, the Chicago Tribune, and in addition to, to opiate uh, pills and medications, uh, uh, everyone knows that, that, that heroin is also an opiate. But now the synthetic opiates have taken over the market, with fentanyl being a hundred times more potent than morphine, and uh, carfentanil or elephant tranquilizer 10,000 times more potent. And the coroner reported the first several cases of carfentanil overdoses in the district uh, last month. Uh, so we know the history in our community, incarceration, if you're black, uh, if you, uh, uh, nowadays it's, it's, it's suddenly a, a medical problem. So, so our folks have already been incarcerated and our challenge is somewhat different. So to answer your, uh, the first part of your question, inequitable access to insurance coverage for, o uh, for overdoses, inadequate access to o opioid uh, use uh, disorder providers and inadequate inadequate access to phenotypically optimal medication dosing. So we went back to Howard and got some of my patients tested. And uh, pharmacogenomics is simply, as was said earlier, the matching of your genomics to medication. And, and, and we're different. You know, some people need lower doses of insulin. Uh, some uh, patients need higher doses of their blood pressure medicine. So, so we, 
uh, brought in the National uh, Human Genome Center at Howard uh, uh, to take a look at this. And this, again, is a slide showing the difference in uh, uh, our population being tested uh, for medications. Most medications are tested in Caucasians and generally Caucasian males, and others will give you the, the rationale behind that and these uh, problems behind that. So we have two problems. We have genetic susceptibility versus resilience, and we also have what we're calling epigenetic uh, susceptibility versus resilience. So these are, uh, uh, sorry to put this up while you're eating. Uh, uh, you were supposed to be eating later. Uh, <laughs> but, but these are uh, pups, we're calling pups, from the same mother but exposed to different, uh, the mother was exposed to different diets during pregnancy. So this is epigenetic. But we've lived through epigenetics. So this is our, our epigenetic susceptibility history from the time that we got here. And when we walk around the city, we'll see clusters of folks who are being, who've been impacted through 400 years of epigenetics. So that's 400 years of toxic stress. But that's also resilience, the fact that they're still alive. Uh, uh, so, so it's a double-edged sword. Uh, so when we look at genetics, we have to look at genetic susceptibility. And these are just different. Uh, mutations in genes that metabolize drugs. Most drugs are metabolized through the liver, and there are about five major pathways, and one particular pathway, the 3A4. So this simply shows that all patients are different. Uh, when a patient walks into the doctor's office, because if we don't have a genetic profile on you, everybody looks the same. So, so if you look on the right-hand side, it's trial and error. We don't know where you're going to fall, whether you're going to be a poor responder, an extensive responder, an uh, ultra, uh, ultra rapid uh, responder, or an intermediate responder. So we just trial and error give you medications. Pharmacogenomics takes it a step further in that we look at your genomics and match it with the medications that may work. So when we talk about the, the two medications, methadone and buprenorphine, to treat opioid addiction, uh, this was a study done uh, uh, in St. Louis at uh, Washington University, uh, and it found that African-American patients are slow metabolizers of methadone, therefore more likely to overdose on the same dose of methadone as, as Caucasian patients. So, so in our uh, patient population, uh, this is a study uh, done uh, 16, uh, uh, 10 years ago on fentanyl uh, on autopsies, and it was done. There were 25 patients, one uh, African-American patient, two Native Americans, and 22 uh, Caucasians, and they showed that fentanyl was metabolized differently. So wh what we did was take my patient population, we tested 170 patients in my office and found that they were rapid metabolizers of, uh, of, of buprenorphine, meaning that they needed higher doses. So if you think back to those slides where I showed you Mississippi and an eight milligram dose, if the patient needs 24 milligrams and you can only give them eight milligrams, that patient is gonna appear not to do well, which has implications in that opioid addiction uh, has uh, three, at least three other uh, epidemics uh, following it. Uh, uh, hepatitis C, 60% of my patients have hepatitis C, 10% have AIDS, and of course, a, a high crime rate. So if you don't treat adequately, then it impacts the entire community. So it's not just that individual patient, it's the entire community that's impacted. So, so we're using pharmacogenomics going forward to really determine uh, the ideal dose, and we were actually able to change the regulations in the District of Columbia from a cap of 24 milligrams to 32 milligrams last year uh, with the help of the health department. Thank you. So if we're not tested, we just don't know. Medications may or may not work. Policies may make it so that we don't get the, the appropriate dose. Um, our next speaker is Harriet Washington. 
Harriet Washington wrote a book called Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. And um, she's the, she did that in 2015 and 2016. Uh, she's a senior research scholar at the National Center for Bio... She has been a, a research scholar at the National Center for Bioethics in Tuskegee University and is an adjunct or assistant professor at several universities. So this has been the big barrier. So Harriet, let me ask your question. You know, our reluctance to participation in clinical trials is obviously deeply rooted in some of the historical experiences that you're going to talk about and, and maybe some experiences that are not that distant in the past. I think it's important to understand why to be able to change this. Um, so what, can you talk about some of the, these kinds of barriers that we're facing and what do we need to do to change them? Hello. We, it's essential for African Americans to participate in medical research. With our dire health profile, we can't afford not to. It's really that simple. However, African Americans, are you able to hear me? Thank you. However, African Americans have been disproportionately abused by the medical research system. And as you suggest, it didn't only happen 300 years ago. It happened 100 years ago. It's happening today. We have not completely, although we have largely, eliminated the abuses, but the abuses that survive are very serious and we need to do something about them. Let me back up for a minute and point out that it's not just Tuskegee. I often read papers predicated on that. Why does Tuskegee evoke this fear? But they're asking the wrong question. There's no evidence only Tuskegee. There's evidence to the contrary, as a matter of fact. I remember Thomas Levis did a paper at Johns Hopkins in which he showed that people who, African Americans who had never heard of Tuskegee were more afraid of medical research than those who had. What it's due to is a very long history. There are 15 <coughs> chapters in my book. There's hardly an arena of medicine that has been untouched by the abuse of African American bodies and minds. So given this history, are we asking the right question? You know, what can we do to foster trust in the medical research system? That's half the question. The other half of the question is, how do we fix the untrustworthiness of the American healthcare system? We have to address both. We can't address African American fears in a vacuum. And frankly, should we remedy or make great strides toward remedying the um, untrustworthiness of the system, then the fears will take care of themselves. The fears are logical reaction to the abuse. They're not paranoia, that's an illogical fear. They're actually rational fears uh, that I call iatrophobia, fear of physicians or fear of healers. So, knowing that, what can we do? I think we have to first understand the history because for many reasons, but prime among them is the fact that trying to understand and fix the medical research system without knowing the history. It's like trying to treat a patient without taking a thorough medical history. You know, it's likely to meet with failure. It's likely to be futile. So one really important thing about the history of uh, medical research and the present contemporary errors in medical research are that many have their root in beliefs that took hold in the 19th century. A very influential group of doctors, the American School of Ethnology, um, had a suite of beliefs about African Americans. And um, I'm going to be very brief, I only have four minutes, but one of them is pain. There's a belief that African Americans did not fear pain. These were influential physicians, and everyone believed them. People in Europe believed them. The belief that African Americans don't feel pain, that you could do surgery on them, you could remove a limb, you know, you could take a scalpel to their genitalia, they wouldn't feel anything. So you don't have to be shy about doing medical research on them. You don't have to fear subjecting surgery without anesthesia. And we could laugh at these fears now. How can anyone actually believe that? But look at our attitudes toward African-American pain today. Studies show consistently that African-Americans are likely to meet with in inadequate response to their pain when you compare a white person with the exact same symptoms in history. They get more effective analgesia. So we haven't completely escaped this belief about African-American pain. And another belief had to do with racialized diseases. You know, there was a belief back in the 19th century, a whole suite of diseases were ascribed only to African Americans. The most infamous was drapetomania. I know somebody here knows what drapetomania is. 
Drapetomania was that disease shown by a slave who ran away. <laughs> you run away, now you have a psychiatric disorder with a strong forensic component. I, we laugh at it now, but how do we look at some diseases now? Do we think of them as black diseases? Yes, look at sickle cell disorder. You know, we think of it as a black disease, even though, you know, the real vulnerability is, live, is evolving in conjunction with the Anaphilus mosquito. If you live near the air, air the mosquito is coming, you're going to be at risk for getting sickle cell. Um, we know this, but we don't practice it. We still treat it and talk as a racial disorder. Um, and then bad parenting. That doesn't sound strictly medical, but it is because of our eugenic practices. I mean today's eugenic practices. And it wasn't that long ago, it was in the 1980s and 1990s, that Norplant was used to temporarily sterilize black women who committed crimes. They were offered a chance. You can go to jail or have Norplant implanted. Approximately 86% of women offered that choice were African American. I don't know how many were Hispanic. So we have this racialized approach to bad outcomes in parenting. Um, Dorothy Roberts has written very persuasively about this in her book, Killing the Black Body. And then we have, you know, a suite of other beliefs about African Americans, but you get the idea. You know, although we laugh at the beliefs of yesterday, the truth is they inform the way we think about disease. That's also true for a predilection that I find really curious. Very sophisticated researchers will look at what they have, they have decided is a biological difference and immediately leap to thinking of it as a genetic difference. It may be genetic, but it may be a disproportionate exposure to a toxin. It could be a suite of other things, and we don't always give enough consideration to other things, although the advent of epigenetics, as you suggest, has really helped in that arena. So basically, I, in terms of solutions, there are lots of solutions. I'm going to just outline a few quick ones. One is that right now, the institutional review boards who, that approve clinical trials, by law, they only need to have one external person on the board, one person not involved in the research or the university. And um, that's not enough to represent you and me. I propose having half the people on these boards be people from the community that will be, um, from which they'll get subjects. If they want to do a clinical trial in this neighborhood, half the people should come from this area. And the response I get sometimes from scientists is that, um, well, they won't understand the scientific, you know, shadings and nuances, they won't be able to really understand the science. Aha, but they have to understand the science. By law, you've got to be able to explain to subjects what you're doing. So if you can't explain to subjects, you can't explain to people on the board. So this is something that really has to be done. Also, when I studied um, medical ethics at Harvard Medical School, one of the things we had to do, and I think everyone in these programs has to do, is pass a, um, a federal course, it was a week-long course, in the program and practice of scientific investigation. It was a very illuminating course. And I think there should be an analogous course for research subjects. No one should be allowed to be a research subject who hasn't taken a course that will educate them about research in general and the things pertinent to the kind of research they're going to undergo. Right now, it's the job of the researcher to do that. But I see a problem there. There's a conflict of interest. You're running a research study, and you're also charged with telling people what this research study is about. You have conflicting interests. You want to recruit people in your study, and you're not perhaps the best person to describe it as opposed to sell it to a subject. So I think that this should be a more, um, shall we say, value-free um, educational process. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you for those recommendations. Um, so our, our last speaker on this panel is Dr. Andrea Phillips, who is a family medicine physician with extensive experience in patient care and clinical research. Um, located in declining West Jackson community, um, Dr. Phillips has maintained her commitment to serving the underserved, which is what she describes as her calling in healthcare. In addition to 30 years of medical practice, she served as the principal investigator to at least 90 clinical research trials over the past 20 years. So Dr. Phillips, you're a practicing family physician in the South that's been running trials for over 20 years. We have heard from, we will hear from our patient, but some say that it's our African-American physicians who can be the greatest barrier or the, greater, the best key 
in closing this gap. I heard you speak in Tunica from the audience. Please share your experience with this audience today and tell us what you think needs to be done to get us more involved. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as uh, Dr. Christensen said, I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm family medicine trained. About 20 years ago, I was a board certified family physician working a full-time job and volunteering at a small Christian clinic on Fridays on my day off and uh, when they, because they lost their physician. So I stumbled over into doing clinical trials because this physician they lost was actually the principal investigator for a hypertension study, which turned out to be the largest hypertension study ever done in this country. It was all hat. Many of you are familiar with that. I had to take over his duties, and that was my introduction to clinical trials. What did I learn from that experience? I learned that all of the prescriptions for the many patients I had been treating for hypertension, which is, you know, epidemic among us, over the past 10 years of practice and the many years of, of training before that, um, were not really studied in my patient population. That was an eye-opening experience for me. That was my introduction to clinical trials. Now, it turns out all hat for the first time being the largest hypertension study ever done in this country, had also the largest cohort of African-American patients and had a large cohort of women in the trials. I got busy learning about what else I need to do in this area. So now this has become my passion. 20 years later, uh, I'm in a private practice, have been for almost 20 years now, because shortly after that ex uh, experience, I opened up private practice of my own. About half of my practice is clinical trials. I've worked with um, the NIH several times. I've done the large uh, government trials, and I've done many, many uh, pharmaceutical trials with the, the pharma companies. What I've learned is that trust is the key to enrolling African Americans in clinical trials. Now, of course, starting out, most of the patients who participated in my trials were my patients. They knew me, they trusted me, I could explain what the trial is about, and they would gladly participate. Some of them and I'll just be honest with you, some of them wanted to participate before they understood the trial. I would not allow that because I believe in the integrity of the system, which is I need to explain this is a trial and we're looking for this information and this is what is required of you if you participate. Fast forward to now, 20 years later, I'm doing a, a very important heart failure trial now. I'm not a cardiologist, but these patients with anything from mild to end-stage heart failure are coming to me to participate in the trial. And over 70% of the patients in this trial at my center are not my patients. So what happened during that 20 years? I think that what I discovered is if physicians who look like me serve with integrity um, and honesty and tell people the process and sit down and explain a trial to them, they will participate because they trust uh, physicians who look like them. The, um, the, the next thing that I discovered is, if you work with patients to help alleviate or overcome the barriers to participation once the trust is there, and the barriers may be even something like, and, and don't laugh, but this is real, um, will the reimbursement I get from this trial, and the reimbursements are small, they're for time, trouble, gas, whatever, interfere with my social security check. You know, it may be something as, as small as that, or, uh, you know, you have 10 visits over a six month period. You know, uh, I may not be able to get off work or whatever. I have come on Saturday and Sunday to accommodate a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring, um, put on or take off, or whatever, but we have to listen to, appreciate, and overcome the barriers that exist um, for these patients. And um, finally, though, about three years ago, as um, 
I am chairperson of the Mississippi uh, component of the National Medical, Medical Association, and I was given the privilege of speaking at our scientific assembly about clinical trials, because over the years I have tried to get my colleagues to uh, participate in these trials. You know, physicians who have far more patients than I have because I've limited my practice because of the trials that I do. I discovered during my preparation for my presentation and during the whole process of presenting and answering questions that the mistrust, the distrust of the system that, ex that um, exists among our patients exists among our physicians. It, it is the same. They did not um, understand or believe that pharmaceutical companies really have our best interests at heart. Uh, even with uh, the FDA mandate that there uh, be an adequate representation of minorities in all of the trials, there was still this distrust. My suggestion to them then is, you write prescriptions like I do every day. So are you gonna trust that the prescription you write is the best, the most efficacious, and the safest for your patients and not have the, enough trust to participate in the trials? You know, most of them were stumped by that. So this is, this is my, um, my take home, and I don't wanna be too long. We have to address, I think, we have to address the barriers for our patients, but we have to address barriers for physicians. There was nowhere in my career that prepared me for this. I, I self-learned, trained, did research, went to meetings, and learned how to do this. Uh, I learned how to incorporate it into my practice, which has made us successful in this uh, venture. However, I think that as a policy, at the legislative level, the government needs to put money, time, education into physicians before they have to stumble over into research. That will help, to minority physicians particularly, that will help prepare us to be investigators. I think also pharma, my challenge to pharma, is put your money where your mouth is. You want minority patients help to train physicians to be investigators. I get calls from all over now to be in trials, but that's because I'm an experienced investigator. If I try to introduce a colleague and include them, the only way that I can get them into trials is for them to be a sub-investigator under me. Uh, and that's almost impractical because they have practices and jobs that they have to attend. But an investment by pharma, and government, I think, can create programs where we train physicians to be reliable investigators, and that will allow us to uh, increase the participation of minority patients because they trust us. And that's my answer. Thank you. Wasn't an African-American physician leading that Alhat study? Because I, I got it. The all had study? Yeah. The, uh, the lead investigator, yes, was an African-American physician. So it started from where at the top, because yes. I, I participated in it myself. So give a hand, a, a hand of a round of applause to our panelists. But is, any questions or comments from the audience? Any questions or comments from the audience? I see someone getting up to the mic. Can you say who you are? Sure. My name is Dr. Eleanor Lisbon. I'm a principal, I was a principal investigator, and now I'm a North American and global medic for Quintiles. So I work for Quintiles, and I really appreciate Dr. Phillips' um, statements. I'm also on the Board of Trustees of the National Medical Association. We have to train physicians to do this, and it's not a course. It's actually experiential. So I appreciate your comments. They're spot on. My question to the ethicist who wrote the book was, with centralized IRBs, do you see a change in the representation? I, I feel like local IRBs actually have that representation of at least a minister or a community person. But you know, we're moving from central, I mean from local IRBs to central IRBs. So what recommendation would you have for central IRBs as far as community and minority representation? My recommendations for, for central IRBs are the same. I think they should be the same all above, above the, on the board. Amend the law, the federal law, so that half of them have to, be, have to include um, potential sub, people from the subject pool, the community of the subject pool. I think that is a minimum necessity. 
in order to not only guarantee fairness, but to broadcast the fact that it's fair. I think knowing that it's only one community person who's obviously got limited autonomy, I mean, what can one person do surrounded by scientists and PhDs? I mean, so I think that's really important. Also, you know, IRBs, um, that's a very good point you brought up. There are different types. They vary in composition. They vary in quality as well. My friend Robert Klitzman wrote a great book, um, The Ethics Police, that did, included surveys of IRBs. And the things he found in surveys are part of, part of the reason why I had this concern about composition. So I think that, you know, it's a dramatic change in a way, but I think it also could bring large dividends. Thanks. Um, one last question, and then I'll just ask the panelists if they wanted to add anything before we close. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. My name is Sheila Tyson, and I'm a diabetic. I have many friends who are diabetic. I want to know about McForman. Is there something that I can read how it affects us as black people? Because I've been talking to a lot of people who are diabetics, who are African Americans, and I'm getting different. Hmm. I don't know, there's something about metformin that's affecting us different. Metformin. Okay. Does anyone here have an answer for that? Hi, I, I'm not familiar with specific research about metformin, but it, it is an old medication that is actually very, very effective in type two, in early stages of treatment of type 2 diabetes. It's actually been shown in a large trial that included a large number of African Americans and Latino Hispanic participants of diabetes prevention trial that it did work to prevent diabetes in people with prediabetes. It didn't work as well as lifestyle, but it was better than taking a placebo. Um, so, but like every medicine, people have side effects and there are people who don't tolerate it. And uh, in general, I think those are things that have individual variations, so. Is there any study if a person is taking insulin and metformin? So frequently in, in diabetes, we go, we may try lifestyle, then met, an oral agent like metformin, and then often uh, eventually the patient ends up on insulin and they could easily be on both. So a small dose of insulin with an oral agent to try to keep the blood sugar within a reasonable range without doing harm. Okay. Because obviously if your blood sugar gets too low, that's not good for your brain. Um, uh, but we do aim to get the blood sugar under a certain control. So yes, that combination is used. Yes. Okay. Dr. Phillips, you wanted to add? And I'll just add that metformin is, you know, that foundational medication. What you may have heard is once your uh, serum creatinine, your kidney function is affected by the disease process, you know, your doctor may pull back on the metformin. But almost, I do a lot of diabetes studies, almost every, in fact, every diabetes study that I can think of builds on metformin. Whatever other medication they're doing the trial on, they require metformin be uh, a part of the treatment. But there's, I mean, I haven't practiced in about 20 years, but there's so many different kinds of medication that if one is creating a problem for you, they should be able to switch it out and, and use something that works better for you. Yeah, so my Last question. My sister participated in a trial, and I freaked out beforehand for her. Did you read all the information? Do you know what they're going to do? How long is it going to last? And she was like, it'll be okay. I'll be fine. She was fine. But how do you propose that we in this room talk to family, community members, friends about both the importance of participating in clinical trials, not scaring each other, but making sure that our friends and family are prepared and taking um, a cautious view that's a good last question. That's a very appropriate last question, and I'd invite anyone that wants that. I'd, I'd like to respond. Um, first of all, in, during the informed consent process for a clinical trial, um, there's a document, and it can range from 15 to 25 pages long, <laughs> that explains what the trial is about, what it requires of the patient, what other options are available. Um, it, it just goes on and on. Any One of the, the things that I do when I sign that contract with the patient, and that's what it is, is I, um, 
I signed saying that I confirmed that I discussed this trial with the patient, that they voiced understanding, that if I didn't feel like they understood, I asked questions to make sure they understood. I gave them time to think about it and ask any questions. And this is a caveat that um, is not listed usually in the written consent, but if that person wants to take the form home and think about it a few days or discuss it with their wife, their family, their, their friends, they are allowed to do that because that part of the process is vital to making sure that the consent is valid. So I, I think one of the things that each person in here can do, if you have a, especially the scourge of diabetes in African-American patients is, is just, it's paramount right now that we address it. So um, especially with diabetes trials and, and heart failure trials that are just so rampant among us, uh, if you have a friend, family member, church member who um, is on maximum medic medical treatment or they have heard about a trial and you want to encourage them, I would suggest that you encourage them to look into the trial. If they uh, take a family member with them to ensure that they are given the proper consenting process, I think that there are built-in protections, usually written in the protocol, but the vital thing is you have the investigator there to protect them as well. I'd like to add that um, I agree with that. And I write that people should bring a medical advocate. Most people have someone in their family or in their sphere, you know, a nurse, a doctor, who can come with them and help ad advocate and interpret for them. But even more importantly than that, it's one more reason why everybody needs a personal physician who they trust. And in my book, I take time to talk about the process of vetting a physician, finding someone who, you know, who's right for you. If you believe in alternatives, fine. Find a physician who's alternative friendly. But you need that person because you need an expert to bounce questions like this off. And um, in addition to what you suggested, which is exactly right, I think. Anyone else want to? I'll, I'll say something. So frequently, the people think that a clinical trial you're going to be experimented on. And that's a, just a general fear. And so we need to just address that up front. And I, as was mentioned before, um, by Dr. Phillips. Uh, and, and I think that the other thing is that clinical trials generally give better care than the average clinical setting, so that's another Absolutely. thing to keep in mind. And then I'll say one more point. A lot of clinical research is not a trial. It's not a drug A or drug B. It's not that kind of a question, but it's observational study or, or seeing what happens. It, like the Precision Medicine Initiative you alluded to, now called All of Us, which we're recruiting for NIH soon, um, is just that. And so, and, and even that in that case, the fear is more, well, what are they going to do with my information and, and my uh, biological samples? And so there are legitimate, important issues to address in doing that. So um, I think that participation in all of these uh, human research studies, clinical studies, are, is really critical. Okay, briefly. Um, for the professionals out there, I guess edited an, um, an issue of the Journal of Law Medicine that focused on um, informed consent. You might find that interesting, but I wanted to point out that one of the problems I think one has in discussing this with lay people is, is the difference between treatment and research. There is an important difference, and I think it's very important to be frank about that. And some of the misunderstanding comes from the fact that people who go into research who are being told their patients have normal expectations that are not going to be met in a clinical trial. A clinical trial is not always about you. Sometimes it's about people who might be helped in the future with the hope that it's also going to help you. But it's different from treatment in which the focus is on you. And I think that's a, if you don't understand that, then you're very likely to be, to feel betrayed if you find it out after you've enrolled. So I think that's a really, important distinction. And the last thing I'm going to say is also a distinction between therapeutic and non-therapeutic research, that which is intended to help the person in the study and that which we only expect might help people in the future or other patients. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I would just add, um, I'm sure almost everyone in here belongs to a national organization of some sort. And I would encourage you to have your organization at maybe one of their national meetings or their regional or local meetings to have someone who can come in and, and talk to the group about clinical trials. 
Hope to Christians. <laughs> May I just do a closing statement as well? Right. Let me let. Are you going to be really brief? <laughs> going to be very brief. Okay. And, and part of my question has been answered because you're addressing some of the fears. But one of the fears is that you're going to get the placebo. Will you address that? How, how does that work? Okay. That, and this is, that, that was the last question, really the last question. That, that's explained during the informed consent. Um, the... You know, the, the informed consent is written, but I explain to patients, if this trial has a placebo, and not all of them do, some are open-label trials, some are comparing one drug to another, some has, have as many as seven different arms where you get different dosages of the same medication, but uh, I explain to the patient, if we're not stopping anything, you know, you may get nothing from this trial because you may get the placebo. If we are stopping something like one of your hypertension medicines or something, then you may experience a worsening of your condition if you um, are not getting an active medication. That's all explained in the, tri in the informed consent process clearly so the patient can understand. What I see pharma companies doing now more in the, in the uh, protocols, though, is using l fewer placebos in trials where they actually stop a medication, so they're adding on. But I just wanted to round out my <clears throat> recommendations uh, about improving our ability to enroll African-American patients uh, in another way, too. We have to look at clinical trials as a part of the healthcare paradigm. I think it has not been that, that um, treatment, um, medication prevention and all like that has not included before now uh, clinical trials as a part of that. It is a part of the healthcare paradigm in a couple of ways. One, it determines which medications get which indications and so therefore affects my prescribing ability. But also what I have found is it is a way to draw into a system patients who are outside of the system. I don't know if you have experienced this in other parts of the nation, but in Jackson, Mississippi, it's ne next to impossible to get an African-American male into the doctor until he's, you know, very advanced in a, in a process. So uh, I think the clinical trials draw in patients. Also, in, in the area of health disparities, we have to look at the low participation of African Americans and other minorities as a health disparity. And I want to add to something yes. that was said before. There's actually been studies that show you get improvement in compliance, therefore improvement in treatment of the, um, this, the disease being studied when you participate in a clinical trial because there's an, an adherence and a check of compliance and adherence to visits and medications that really doesn't usually exist in my regular um, practice. So give our, our panelists an, a round of applause. I think we've really had a very robust discussion of this issue, and we want to thank you. And if you haven't had lunch, go, please go ahead and have your lunch. So do we go right in? Ms. Kwame, you, are you ready, Dr. Satcher? I'm sure you're more than ready. So, thank you so much. So, we're, before our next panelists come up, we're going to have a keynote by a very special person. And that's Dr. David Satcher. And I'll start out by saying, as far as I'm concerned, he's still my nation's doctor. <laughs> Anyone who can get me up to do aerobics at 6 a.m. at an anime convention is a man of great influence. <laughs> he's an innovator, he's a trailblazer, and he's been an inspiration to many. In his career, Dr. Satcher has left a legacy at just about every African-American health profession school and many others besides. After, um, of course, he was president of Mahari School of Medicine before being the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the administrator for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. As Surgeon General, 
he changed the whole dynamic of that office by also becoming the Assistant Secretary of Health, something I think that you hold the distinction of. I don't think anyone else, has anyone else ever been both Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary? One, one other, Julie Richmond. Okay. But that was quite unusual, which gave him much more authority than a, a Surgeon General would normally have. He also, um, I can't even read my own handwriting. <laughs> Okay, so he served as Surgeon General also, of course, during the Clinton administration and during the first part of the Bush administration. And I, I seem to remember calling you up, Dr. Satcher, during the Bush administration. I think it might have been during the SARS scare. And the then secretary, who will remain nameless, was very ineffective at conveying information to the public and, and allaying fears, and I said, let me call Dr. Satcher, because he needs to, our nation's doctor needs to come to the rescue. In 2006, he established the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at um, Morehouse School of Medicine, from which he recently retired, and as though he didn't have enough to do, he also co-founded the African American Network uh, Against Alzheimer's. With all of those accolades and achievement. He's still a really down-to-earth person. I recently saw Dr. Satcher at the National Medical Association, and you could, he could have taken his celebrity status and just, you know, set aside for most of the things. But at every session that I attended, he was there in the audience participating along with the rest of us, and I really um, admired that. And he, of course, added a lot to the discussion. Um, so he's a person that, as I said, has inspired us all, um, and I, I am sure you will agree that our nation is better off for the service that he has given and continues to give. So please join me in giving a really warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. David Satcher. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Christensen. Uh, I could have sat there and listened to you introduce me all day. <laughs> but uh, seriously, you, um, you've done such a great job of leadership in this nation. You're a physician, but also really outstanding legislature, outstanding congressperson who contributed so much. And, and I hope people appreciate <laughs> I hope people appreciate the contribution you made to the Affordable Care Act and making sure that it included what it needed to. And we continue to struggle with that, but we appreciate you. Well, you've been sitting here for a while, and I appreciate the fact that you're still sitting here. I'll try to be brief, um, but I have to tell you a story. I, was, I spent about an hour with the, surge, the current Surgeon General yesterday, and uh, and I was just thinking about a story about a Surgeon General who had just become Surgeon General. He had just gotten his uniform. It fit perfectly. And he was very proud. And, uh, and everywhere he went, uh, people from all around came to hear him speak. So he said to his staff, I want to go somewhere and speak where people wouldn't ordinarily hear me speak. So they thought about it. And they took him to a nursing home. And when he, when he got there, there was a lady at the door in a wheelchair. And um, she was greeting everybody. It wasn't her job. She just did it. And um, so she greeted the Surgeon General, and he said, Ma'am, I mean, do you know who I am? And she said, No. He said, you, you mean you don't know who I am? She said, No. But she said, if you go up to the front desk, they will tell you who you are. <laughs> well, let me just say that I, I really appreciated the panel discussion. Some really outstanding people who have done some 
outstanding research uh, and who also communicate very well about the challenges. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be brief. I know people don't like to talk about the Tuskegee study, but I'm going to revisit one aspect of it. Um, in 1972, I was a Macy faculty fellow out at King Drew in Watts. Now, many of you know King Drew did not open until around 1969. I was finishing my residency in pediatrics and medicine at Rochester. And when I heard about uh, King Drew, I had worked with Martin Luther King Jr. when I was a student at Morehouse, had gone to jail with him and others. And so I decided when I heard about that they were going to open a hospital name for Martin Luther King Jr. I had to be a part of that. I just had to be a part of it. So I made up my mind that I was going to leave Rochester at the end of that year and go out to Watts and work at King Drew. And uh, they couldn't understand that. They said, well, David, if you stay here, you'll probably be chief resident. You go out there and nobody will ever hear of David Satcher again. <laughs> but I went anyway. But seriously, um, it's interesting that it was in 1972 uh, that the Associated Press had this big article about the Tuskegee study. Most people had not heard about it, but this article came out with details about these 400 or so men, black men, in Alabama who had been diagnosed with syphilis but not treated and followed for many years I believe it was 1959. It started in 1932, but it was in 1959 that the study was moved from Washington to the CDC. And then in 1972, the article came out. CDC discontinued the study uh, before the article came out, but was, was very involved in that. So when I went to the CDC in uh, 1993 as director, we had a commission to really revisit the Tuskegee study, because we wanted to really know the details of what happened, why did it happen, how did it happen. And so the commission was headed by Vanessa Gamble, whom many of you know. And um, the commission completed its work and submitted its report to me in 1996. And um, I thought it was a great report, so I called Washington as you know, CDC is the only major federal agency outside of Washington. And I talked to Donna Shalala, who was secretary, and, um, and she invited me to come to Washington and, and present the commission's report. So I did. Our meeting was about 7 p.m. And she was so moved about the report, and she said, I'm going to call President Clinton right now so that he will know about this report. And she did. He was in his office. It was about 8 o'clock. And uh, he said right away that uh, he agreed with the commission's recommendation that there needed to be a presidential apology. So we started the process, including bringing the surviving members of that group of men to Washington. We had dinner with them the night before. And on May 16, 1997, in the East Room of the White House, President Clinton issued the apology. Now, these were the four things, and this is why I'm telling the story, because there are four things that were really critical to that, to his apology. It wasn't just, we're sorry. He said, we're going to establish a memorial to the participants in Tuskegee and the surrounding community. We're going to require in the future community participation in all government-funded research. Three, we're going to establish a bioethics research center at Tuskegee. And I saw Dr. Reuben Warren here earlier. I don't know if he's here. But uh, Dr. Reuben Warren, who was, who was dean when I was president at Meharry, he was dean of the School of Dentistry, he has been heading the bioethics center at Tuskegee for a few years now, and, and I think doing an outstanding job. And the fourth recommendation from President Clinton was that those of us who are involved with patient care and especially research would have to demonstrate every two years that we really understood the rules and regulation as a way of protecting patients. 
That was the Tuskegee study and the recommendations that came out of it. And I think, I think that's what's important about it, is that out of that came some very strong recommendations about monitoring not just research, but the way we take care of patients. And, and not enough of that's been done, of course, but that was the goal. And we have to keep working on it and making sure that it gets better all the time, as, as the panel, earlier panel said. Well, I want to mention three clinical research, and as, as, as you heard, not all clinical research is clinical trials, but very early out in, in Watts at the King Drew Medical Center, um, after President Nixon had announced that there would be $50 million set aside to do sickle cell research, and they were going to fund sickle cell research centers, 10. Um, well, I was a fellow, and, and um, my supervisor had, had to go to India for six months, and they said, well, David, why don't you uh, lead an effort to get a write a proposal for a sickle cell center. And I figured they would just give me something to do, to keep me out of trouble. But I, but I did it. And I, it was a great way for me to get to know the people at King Drew, the department chairs and OBGYN, basic science, others. And we were funded. But after we, of course, got funded, people really got on board and got excited. It was the first uh, NIH grant that King Drew had ever received. And so a, a lot of people rallied around it, including the community. The other thing I think, and this is a major point, that, that I think was important is that when I, when I arrived at King Drew, there was nobody who was comfortable of treating sickle cell patients in crisis. Uh, and so I ended up with a phone next to my bed when a patient came in in crisis, in the evening especially, they would call me, and I would drive into the emergency room to take care of the patient. Uh, it's a terrible way to live, to have a phone by your bed. But you know, that really is what led to so many other things uh, there in terms of my work with hypertension, as well as with sickle cell disease, and a lot of other leadership roles. Because as I went into the emergency room to see patients, Sometimes um, I would have time to look at the records of patients and figure out that almost half of the patients in this emergency room have severely elevated blood pressures. So Jerome Johnson and I set up the hypertension clinic. And one thing just led to another. But the basis of it, critical, I think, is that patient care is first and foremost about caring. Uh, we have a saying at the Satyat Leadership Institute is that uh, we need leaders who first and foremost care about patients. But we also need leaders who know enough. We need leaders who have the courage to do enough. And we need leaders who will persevere until the job is done. But caring, there's a reason why this is called health care. And it, it should in, indicate that we really care about the people that, that we're treating. Well, the thing I want to say about sickle cell, uh, there were a lot of people whose career developed around that. Lou Sullivan headed the uh, Sickle Cell Research Center at Boston University. Marilyn Gaston, who many of you know, headed the sickle cell program at NIH. Clarice Reed. These are all people who, in many ways, wrote rose to prominence around the whole sickle cell movement, um, did research, supervised research, and in many cases went on, as Lou Sullivan did, to head institutions. So it was an opportunity that many African Americans in medicine and academic medicine had not had before. And that leadership role with the, with the institutes uh, made a big difference. Well, we did a study of sickle cell disease that was really important. Marilyn Gaston coordinated that study. She was at NIH. Uh, and the study was 
to see if, in fact, we could improve the natural history, if you will, of sickle cell disease? Was it really uh, necessary for people to die so young? And the life expectancy then was, like it is now in some parts of Africa, very low for sickle cell disease. And out of that discussion, several institutions came together to intervene and to do what you might call a clinical trial, but to really use penicillin prophylaxis with sickle cell patients starting at the age of two months and then continuing that up until five years of age or, or later. It was never clear when it was safe to stop it. But I think that intervention uh, with penicillin with sickle cell patients resulted in many of them surviving into adulthood. Uh, because prior to that, it was very unusual. And many sickle cell patients died before the age of five. So that clinical research, that trial, if you will, resulted in an intervention. Of course, we've come a long way since then in terms of ways that of dealing with sickle cell disease. But that one intervention of penicillin prophylaxis from the age of two months to at least five years of age made a big difference. So it was a, it was a kind of clinical trial that you could be proud of, and I think people in the community was very proud that it was making a difference in the lives of these individuals and families. The CDC recently completed work with the American Indian population in several states. And it's interesting, when I was director of the CDC in 1996, I had heard about Newt Gendricks, but I had not met him. And they kept telling me, this, he, you know, this is, we're in his district. So when the people came to me with this idea about the fact that we can do a better job of treating diabetes, diabetes on Indian reservations, because so many of them are dying of end-stage renal disease, they had a well-thought-out plan. I decided to meet with Newt Gendricks, whom I had never met before. And they said, now, now David, um, be prepared you probably, even though it's a 30 minute meeting, you probably will not get more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes with Newt Gendricks. He's busy. So we went and we met with him. And um, I was amazed because at the end of two hours, we were still talking. And he had even gotten out crying. He was, he was writing. I found out later that, of course, he had family members with diabetes. So he had a personal interest. But anyway, he came back to Washington and got $200 million to be used to intervene in the treatment of, of American Indians with diabetes. And to, so treatment went from like 42% to 74%. And if you're paying attention to the MMWR in September, there was an article showing that end-stage renal disease among American Indians had decreased dramatically in this country in the last 10 years. Dramatic reduction in end-stage renal disease so it's another example of a, of a clinical trial that made a lot of difference uh, for a lot of people. And so there is really something to be said, especially when it comes to community intervention in dealing with a problem like diabetes in the American Indian population or sickle cell disease, or other things in the African American population. Well, there's a very interesting program at the Morehouse School of Medicine um, and, uh, in fact, it was funded by uh, NICH, the, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. But it allowed uh, some of our faculty members, in fact, two very outstanding uh, women faculty members who were active in a church downtown to implement a trial with church members and some of the community associated with it. And, again, it was dealing with diabetes but it was about uh, the role of personal control in diabetes and the role of, uh, of interventions. And it's interesting, so why was uh, informed consent not a big issue? Why did they not have a lot of trouble getting people to participate? Well, number one, it was in their church and in their community, 
So people felt that they were all involved with the study. And that's one thing I think that we, that's what President Clinton was talking about when he talked about community participation uh, in research. And we've got to find a way, as an earlier panel said, we've got to find a way to get more community participation. You know, it's one thing when, when the people coming to you are people that you don't know, uh, they, they, they don't live in your community, and all of a sudden you're being asked to participate in a clinical trial. Um, I think the, the physician who takes care of the patient is really critical. I think people need to know that their physician is involved when it comes to clinical trials. Now, there's a problem with that, and that is so many of our people don't have personal physicians. So when the Republicans and others on Capitol Hill talk about rescinding or repealing the Affordable Care Act, and you know that it means that 20 million people are going to lose their insurance. It's, it's not a good, easy case to make in terms of trying to get people to trust the system who is willing to, to withdraw from them their source of health care. I, I, remember, I remember being in one state speaking, and uh, this was one of the states that uh, refused to uh, expand Medicaid. So at a certain point, I just asked the, um, the people that were working with me, why is it that the governor uh, does not want to expand the Affordable Care Act and therefore expand Medicaid? And the answer was, well, the governor does not like Obama. Now, can you imagine that the health care of millions of people can ride on that kind of attitude. Uh, but I think that's, those, that's the kind of thing that we're facing right now. And that's the kind of thing we have to survive and overcome. And I think we will. I think we will overcome. I think the Affordable Care Act is a major step forward in care in this country. It's not perfect. It's a step forward. It's not the last step. But it's, it's really disturbing to hear how lightly people can take something as important as getting 15 more million people covered by health insurance. It's really, really, really something to behold. And so we've got, as a, as a nation, we've got to rise up above that. Well, I had a personal experience with clinical trials. and. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to share it with you because it's a little different. Um, my wife, whom some of you know, Nolas, is a poet. And she's published two books of poetry. I think my Angelo wrote the introduction to one. Uh, her mother died about 10 years ago of Alzheimer's. And uh, she had been in an institution for several years. And because of what happened to her mother, we had what we call in medicine, I guess, a high index of suspicion. So Nola was diagnosed early at the National Naval Medical Center as having Alzheimer's. And um, so when we left Washington and moved back to Atlanta for me to work at the Moore School of Medicine, uh, Nola was doing fine as far as you know we could tell. Uh, she had herself decided to stop driving on the freeway. And I didn't really think a lot about it. So I, I read about a clinical trial that was starting at Emory and decided that it would be good to have NOLA enroll. One thing I already knew that Alzheimer's, the risk for Alzheimer's is about three times as great in African Americans as in the majority population. And, and it's an increasing burden on African-American families. I mean, a really increasing burden, a care burden. You know, we're fortunate in being able to afford home care and care in an Alzheimer's center. But there are going to be so many African-American families where members of the family are going to have to drop out of their careers in order to take care of loved ones. Uh, the, the, you know, medical care, home care, those things are expensive. So I thought anything we can learn, we can contribute to the learning more about Alzheimer's, then we should do that. 
And plus, Nola had siblings and, and others, so we needed to know as much as we could. Well, this is what happened, and this is what happens with, with research. It was double blind, so we had no idea whether Nola was getting the medication that was being tested or whether she was getting placebo or what have you. But still, we had to, we had to be diligent. We had to keep the appointments. We had to really co cooperate with this clinical trial. Several things happened. One is, um, and I think this is true, that often in clinical trials, people do get better care. Um, Emory had a, a program there where they, where they tested whether you should be driving. Now, I hadn't done that with NOLA, but when they found out that she shouldn't be driving, I was relieved um, because I didn't think that she should, but we hadn't done a test, but the test showed that uh, she was at risk driving, even though she wasn't driving on the freeway. We went through a year of that clinical trial. We never knew whether she was on placebo or the medication that was being tried. We never knew, and, and I think, as many of you know, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on Alzheimer's trials. And, and, and so far, unfortunately, uh, including the Eli Lilly study, unfortunately, we have not found an effective treatment. But my point is, we all have to participate in that effort. We all have to join the effort to support the kind of research that ultimately will lead to an effective treatment. Uh, African Americans have almost to date three times the risk. We don't know why, and we don't know exactly where all of this will lead. So you, you continue to participate, take risk, because ultimately we've got to get more answers when it comes, comes to Alzheimer's. We need more African Americans to participate in clinical trial. And I could talk about Alzheimer's a lot because I've been quite involved with the uh, U.S. against Alzheimer's. I serve on the board. But I'm especially concerned about caregivers and what's happening with caregivers. Many of these caregivers will die before their loved ones because Alzheimer's does not necessarily have a major impact on the rest of the body other than the brain than it would otherwise. So many of them uh, will, in fact, Die because number one, many of them are under a lot of stress. Caregivers work under a lot of stress. And when it's your parent or grandparent, the stress is even greater. So we need to work together to make sure, number one, that people get the health care they need. We need to fight very hard for that. And we need to continue to fight for more funding for Alzheimer's research. That we need to make a commitment to. Well, this is a very important topic, and I hope it will be the, not the end of it. I think we need to work together to try to see how we can move research forward. Um, President Clinton made a statement at the end of his uh, apology. He basically apologized on behalf of the nation for the Tuskegee study. And then he said, I can apologize we can do all of, of, of these things. We can, the four areas that I mentioned, we can, we can make sure that there's community involvement, the establishment of bioethic research at Tuskegee, et cetera. But then he said, we need something from you. And he was talking to the survivors and the black community. We need you to forgive us for the Tuskegee study. And we need you to become more involved in clinical trials. That was how he left that. Now, and I agree with him, the one thing I would take it further is that if we expect people to be involved in clinical trials, and I do, we need to make sure that as a nation, everybody has access to quality health care. Everybody. I don't, I don't believe it's fair to expect people to be equally represented in finding answers to medical questions and developing new treatment if they're not equally represented in the health system in terms of receiving care. 
it's a tough, it's a tough discussion, but it's time for us to make very clear that we either are going to be a nation that cares about people, that's going to provide care to all people, or we're not. And if we're not, then we got to figure out, out a way to really resolve a great dilemma. Thank you. We're really short on time, but if there are two people that want to ask a question or make a comment, we'll take two only. I'm not going to um, go beyond that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Teche. I'm here with uh, Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. In 2013, I lost both my parents. My dad first, who was a caregiver to my mom, who passed later in September of Alzheimer's. You mentioned that you've done extensive studies, and we still don't have a cure. However, there are some who feel that <clears throat> a homeopathic method is what staves off Alzheimer's, i.e. the coconut oils, the omega-3s, et cetera, having a healthier diet, um, because Alzheimer's is determined to be plaque that forms on the brain. Can you please speak to those thoughts? Well, um if you're asking me if I can say whether that's correct or not, I can't. I don't, again, I think that's why we have clinical trials. I think there will be all kinds of claims about what works and what doesn't work. But until you take the time to really study it. Now, getting back to my personal situation, my wife was diagnosed almost 17 years ago. Um, and she's doing better than you would expect after 17 years. Now, if that study had not been double blind, we would have sworn that it was because of the medication, right? Well, it turns out the medication had nothing to do with it. it, it you know, people differ. And there are a lot of patients, and I think maybe even more so African-American patients, who live longer than the seven-year average that we, we hear about for Alzheimer's disease. So I think, I think a question like the kind you're raising needs study. I think for people to go out and invest their personal money in things that have no basis in, in proof is unfair. So I think that's why we have NIH, and that's why we have other, the CDC, is because we want to know whether or not something works before we invest a lot of money and time and resources. But it's a good question. Research starts with questions, let me tell you. If you don't ask questions, you never get the answers. So I'm not knocking anybody for asking questions. But you've got to follow those questions with a structured approach to, to achieve an answer. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Tyrone Wilson, NCI. I would like your comments on Henrietta Lacks and her role in cancer research for the past 60 years the healer sales, the contribution she has made to cancer research? Yes. I like your comments on that. Well, I mean, it's, it's quite a story. That's the first thing. Um, Henrietta Lack's story is it's quite a story. And believe me, there are many others like it that you may never hear about. But uh, she was an interesting, beautiful woman, uh, full of life. Uh, but when she developed um, cancer of the uterine, I believe, um, it took her down. And at Johns Hopkins, of course, they, um, they took her cells. And by the way, Tuskegee was also involved in studying Henrietta Lacks cells. There was a time in which vaccines were made from, from cells from Henrietta Lacks cancer. And, um, and I, I, Tuskegee has done a lot of very interesting research. It, it's too bad that it's the syphilis study that gets all of the, uh, the publicity, but when it comes to things like the research that was done to develop the first vaccines. Now, I know later we had the salt vaccine and we had the saving vaccines, but in the early days, Tuskegee was involved in the development of vaccines. And that means a lot to me because when I was director of the CDC, we made a decision that we were going to wipe polio out throughout the world. We we're going to eradicate it. And we came up with a strategy. And I remember being in India for a whole week 
in which we immunized 100 million children, because India at the time had the largest number of patients with polio. We immunized 100 million children against uh, polio. I believe it was 1996. And the good news, of course, is that uh, India has eliminated polio. It has, we have not eradicated it because in public health, when you say you've, you've eradicated something, it means that it's eradicated from the world, like smallpox, right? We can't say that about polio. But we have uh, eliminated it from most countries in the world. And the ones where we haven't eliminated it, it's mainly because of war. It's Afghanistan, it's Nigeria, it's Pakistan. That's where we have polio. Other than that, polio has been eliminated, not eradicated. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you, please. Hello? Where's that coming from? I would like to, I would like to ask a question. OK, while, while everybody is coming up to the stage, go ahead. Okay. If it's brief. Uh, where are you? Excuse me. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, um, I am a carrier of the sickle cell um, trait, and I passed it on to my son. And recently, I found that the two of my grandchildren carried the trait. What could, what should be my concern for those uh, two grandchildren with that trait? Well, for most people, sickle cell trait, there is really no major concern. Uh, there was a time in which they were saying that very high altitudes, um, and even now, there's some evidence that very high altitudes may be a challenge for, sick, for sickle cell trait. But as a rule, sickle cell trait is not a, not a disease. Um, but what your concern should be, of course, that they understand that if you have a sickle cell trait and you mate with somebody with sickle cell trait, there's a one in four chance with each pregnancy of that outcome being sickle cell disease. Oh. And um, when we started, it was like SS and, and AS, and the trait being S and A and disease SS. Now we know that there are other forms of sickle cell disease. So it gets a little bit more complicated than that. But um, as a rule, sickle cell trait is not considered a disease. But you hear, if you listen to the football games, uh, every year you hear of some player who has sickle cell trait who has trouble at the highest altitudes. Well, I do too. I mean, I don't have sickle cell trait. But I have, <laughs> but I have trouble at the high altitudes. I remember being in, being in Mexico City when I was in office, 12,000 feet. And as I do every morning, I went out to jog, and I, and I virtually passed out. The difference it makes when you're at a high altitude in terms of respiration is really can be very serious. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Satcher. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and, and be with us this afternoon and to share those words and the encouragement for all of us to be involved. So our two last panelists. Um, I'm going to turn first to Sheila Thorne, uh, who is fluent in three languages. Uh, she spent two decades working for pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device companies, hospital systems, and health plans throughout North America, Europe, and Latin America across a broad array of categories. She's a co-chair of the Cultural and Linguistic Competency Committee of the Federal Office of Minority Health, the New Jersey Office of Minority Health. And um, Sheila, you've been involved in actually working to get connect African Americans to clinical trials. So can you talk about that experience? What are some of the barriers that you have seen that we still need to overcome? Thank you, Dr. Christensen. Good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, we certainly do miss your voice in Congress, so it's good to see you again. Thanks. Um, I have been, had the privilege of working for the pharmaceutical industry uh, for better more than two decades, but I've been black a little bit longer than that. So uh, <laughs> it's all coming together. Uh, and I've been involved in clinical trial recruitment of black, Latinos, Asians, and Native Americans for about uh, 12 to 15 years. And like the line says in the insurance company, um, I've seen a lot, so I know a lot. And I want to share with you some of the uh, challenges that I have discovered in uh, developing 
of recruiting blacks, Latinos, and Asians for clinical trials. First and foremost, the 1993 Revitalization Act mandates that federally funded programs prioritize the inclusion of diverse groups. This act does not give a mandate to pharmaceutical companies, and yet they conduct nearly 80% of the clinical trials in this country. So I am encouraged by the companies like some of your sponsors that have stepped out and made a commitment to increase diversity even though there's no le regulatory or legislative mandate for them to do so. Nearly uh, these companies are having challenges because of the systemic issues regarding recruiting clinical trials. And there are about five, and I'll do them very quickly. First and foremost, it's with the protocols. The protocols that are written to describe the reason for the clinical trials, the outcomes, the endpoints, and why they're doing it are about 100 pages long. And one of the challenges that I have discovered are the exclusion criteria in those protocols of who cannot be in the trial or who would not be eligible. You can't change the scientific protocol, but some of them are culturally laden with challenges. For example, worked on a clinical trial for diabetes, and the exclusion criteria was you cannot have had a stroke or heart failure in the last six months to be in the trial. Well, for African Americans, you've already cut out a whole bunch of folks because that's prevalent in those communities. Uh, I did a, worked on a trial for mental health, clinical depression. The exclusion criteria, the inclusion criteria was you had to be diagnosed with clinical depression, you had to have a primary family member with clinical depression, and the depression could not be related to alcohol or substance abuse. Well, unfortunately, we are often not diagnosed, and secondly, even if we are, we very often self-medicate, and so it's hard to find a group that have that exclusion. So those are the challenges which make it necessary for you to cast the net very wide so the trial may have to be longer, it may have to cost more to find the cohort that meets that criteria. Second is the principal investigators, the site selection. The investigators we've talked about, we need more investigators of color. The site selection is done by the pharmaceutical company and unfortunately they often choose sites that are not in black or Latino neighborhoods or even close to them. Worked on a trial for uterine fibroids with black and Latino women. Went to the state of Virginia, large medical center. When they selected the center, they didn't know it would take these women two buses to get to the center. And there was nothing in the budget to compensate these women for coming to that place. So the site selection can be problematic in terms of transportation for those who would be eligible for the trial. Then there's the site team, the clinical research coordinator. That person or that team often has very few, if any, people of color. So when I'm driving you to go to the site, I want to see me. I want to see people who look like me so that I have a comfort level with working with that site for sometimes 26 weeks, 52 weeks on a trial. So even if you have no people of color, that can be problematic from a comfort level. But the real obstacles, the last three that I'll mention quickly, are when the site is selected, the investigators are chosen, and the deadlines are, are fierce in terms of meeting the need to recruit numbers of patients, the pharmaceutical company hands over the trial development methodology to a clinical research organization a contract research organization, and there are a number of them that are very reputable and very large. However, I have learned that there is a cultural deficit among many of those organizations where there are no people of color in leadership positions, and so there may be limited sensitivity to the challenges about people in the trial. Quick example worked in a trial for hepatitis C, race-specific trial. When you enter a trial, you have to be concerned about what you eat. And one of the booklets that was developed by this clinical research organization dealt with foods that you cannot eat if you're in this trial. They were giving this booklet to black and Latino patients. The first rule was, for 52 weeks, do not eat fried, greasy, or spicy food. <coughs> now, again, there's a reason for that scientifically, but already, I mean, 75 of us are gone. <laughs> 
Uh, and then when I was helping a, a CRO recruit Asian Indians for a clinical trial uh, for hypercholesterolemia, they called me and said, we need help. We can't seem to have success. And I said, what's the problem? We don't know what an Asian Indian is. Are they Asian or are they Indian? <laughs> So again, these examples are not to criticize the clinical research groups because they are reputable, they do a good job, they are highly regulated, they're scrutinized, the IRBs are always there, but we need to fill that cultural deficit to have more people of color in those clinical trials, to make sure the sites are culturally competent, and to make sure that the materials that are being developed will resonate with these populations. Thank you. Those are things we don't often think about, obviously, but um, they're very, very, very important. So our wrap-up speaker is Lorenita Lucas. And Lorenita Lucas is, has a master's in public administration from Baruch College as a National Urban Fellow. She innovatively combines her experiences as an event planner and project manager with her training as a fitness professional to spread messages of health and wellness through her company, Every Work on Wellness, or WOW. Although she enjoys all of her professional endeavors, her most rewarding work is through the yoga and wellness program she created for teen and young adult moms in foster care and residential facilities. And I think we couldn't end this on a, with a, a better speaker than Ms. Lucas. And Ms. Lucas, we truly thank you for being willing to share your personal story on this important panel with us and with our audience. We can talk forever about the pros and cons, but no one is more influential um, than someone who's gone through that experience and can really speak to it. So we're all anxious to hear from you, and please go right ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm here as a patient and a survivor. Um, in 2014, I was a wellness professional, traveled the country, just talking about health and wellness issues, um, wrote articles, health and wellness was everything. However, in October of 2014, I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. At the time of my diagnosis, it had already gone to my liver and my bones. So that's where I am now. There's the funny thing that you just learn things about cancer as you go along. There's no cancer in my breast, but it is in my liver and my bones still. So, um, I've always had an interest somehow in clinical trials. In my graduate work, um, some of my research uncovered uh, where I had to look at research in clinical trials. So I joke with people all the time who say they don't want to be in, in clinical trials or they're scared of clinical trials. Well, I tell people when you take simple medicines like aspirin, you are in a clinical trial mm -hmm. because they didn't test it on you, mm -hmm. they tested it primarily on white men. So every time I take an aspirin, I'm in an unsanctioned clinical trial. So we need to think about these things as reasons why we need to be involved. Because if we're not tested officially, we're tested unofficially. But um, I also served, this is before cancer, I also served on a, an advisory panel for the National Medical Association, which was Project Impact. And, um, and it was increasing minority participation in clinical trials. And the good thing about that, it wasn't just participation of patients, it was participation of doctors, uh, private and of, 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 of PIs, it looked at how everyone needs to have a, um, a bigger stake in this game of involvement in clinical trials. Now, to move to me as being a, a patient, I was enrolled in an immunotherapy clinical trial. So, needless to say, my messages of health and wellness now include 
Uh, me speaking more at breast cancer conferences. Uh, this year alone, um, I spoke in Oakland, I spoke in Philly. So I'm able to talk to a lot of women and hopefully encourage a lot of women who have uh, breast cancer. With that said, um, I'm sure as everybody's heard a lot about immunotherapy, right? And for those of you who know, um, phase one clinical trials, some of my friends and I who have been in phase one clinical trials, we're like, we're hardcore, mm -hmm. you know, because a phase one clinical trial, you're pretty much in there to determine the dosage and the side effects. So when I was in the clinical trial, I used to always tell people, if my head blows off right now, note the date and time because, you know, otherwise it was all for nothing. So just note the date and time and we'll be fine because we didn't know what was going to happen. Maybe my head would blow up, but it didn't. <laughs> But um, so I was in a, I was, as I said, I was traveling around the country, so I really wanted to be in this phase one immunotherapy, the hottest thing going around trial, so I could be the it girl as I'm traveling across the country. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately for me, the clinical trial did not work. It did not work. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, because it didn't work, but I'm still committed to getting African Americans to participate in clinical trials. It's not always gonna work. That's why it is a clinical trial. But we need to be involved. Um, there are just so many things you, um, they, could, they could find out. And one of the reasons we need to be involved is that um, some of the, even some of the thresholds that are developed are developed based on white people. So for example, I was on um, one of the, I try to do all the newest, hottest things. One of the newest, hottest things in breast cancer care was a drug called Ibrantz. Mm -hmm. And um, Ibrantz, when a lot of black women would take it, we would still be okay with lower white blood counts than the average white person. So if I'm being told I can't, I, the drug needs to be held back for a week or so based on a threshold that I'm probably never gonna reach, I can't take the drug, I'm not going to be well. However, in Georgetown, they started to track that and there is a clinical trial now for women looking at eye brands, the effectiveness, and lower, um, lower white blood counts in African-American women. Now that could make a big difference in their survivorship because that medicine won't be held back or just taken away from them. Um, it, from a patient point of view, um, you do receive the best health care when you're in a clinical trial. Actually, it's almost too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they will, you, you will have more EKGs, more CT scans, um, you're in all the time, blood work is done all the time because they need to at least make sure you're maintaining some level of health. So that is, that is one good thing. Another thing that's not mentioned a lot of times is that you um, can leave a clinical trial whenever you want to. No questions asked, none. So that's something that um, a lot of times people have the fears they should know just as easy as you get. It's actually as easier to get out than it is to get in. Um, now, just, to, just one thing about uh, barriers. Uh, I, as I travel across the country, I hear that a lot of African-American women don't even get asked to participate. So if you're not asked to participate, most people aren't like me who were like from day one, but I want to be in a clinical trial, I want to be in a clinical trial. Most people aren't like that. They may not know that they could even be eligible for clinical trials. So one is physicians 
do need to be a better job, do a better job of asking everyone. Um, another thing is, and I don't know what can be done about this, but the protocols are so long. I think my protocol was 50 pages long. And by protocol, I meant that's the contract we talked about earlier. And it can be cumbersome and confusing. And, and I understand all this stuff, but it was still, this is a lot. And because a lot of times when I do things, I look at it from the point of view of, I'm going to speak up. I understand this, but I feel sorry for women who might have uh, less education, might not have people who, in their family members, who could go over these things with them. So somehow, the protocol needs to be a little bit more user friendly, because I've heard some people say, I couldn't understand the contract, and that was one of the reasons they did not uh, engage in the clinical trial. So that, that's, just a major, that's just a major thing. But I encourage people to do things like this, listen, get comfortable when your family members and your friends want to come to you, or if you just hear them talk about being in a clinical trial, be encouraging be encouraging of that. Um, the thing is, you can take the protocol home. You should, it's 50 pages. I'm not gonna sit there and, um, I'm not gonna sit there and just sign something. I, however, I will say, do not take too long because in some clinical trials, those slots go like that. So I know someone who, I kept on telling her she was taking too long, she was taking too long. She took two weeks to decide, and they were like, okay, glad we got your signature, your slot is gone. Because it, some, of, some trials can be highly competitive to get in. So, whereas you want to be comfortable with what you're signing, don't hesitate and take too long to do it. Um, so those are just some of my experiences. out in about five minutes, and we're really half over hour over time, but if there's a question or comment, go right ahead. You couldn't hear me, oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not a... <laughs> <laughs> question, we'll take two. Is it on? Okay. So my question is for the pharmaceutical companies. Is there an economic motivation to focus on white men or white people in particular because they're more likely to get coverage and be able to pay for the drugs that they're developing and other populations are less likely to be covered and be able to pay for the drugs? Is that part of the formula? Pay for the drugs. Yes. Um, I think it probably is the reverse. They don't necessarily feel that communities of color uh, would be responsible enough to be in a clinical trial or to have the coverage to take on that responsibility. So it's not so much they prefer white, it's just that it may take longer, it may cost more, and it's a bit more challenging to become culturally competent to embrace multiculturalism consistently. Uh, they see the need. The demographics are pushing them to that end, and many are struggling with how to do it right, uh, and some are successful. But clearly, there needs to be more of a focus to prioritize these populations because we are no longer minorities. We are the mainstream populations and probably the end users. So it's a change in the mindset, the philosophy of uh, who should be involved in clinical trials. I had one company tell me, well, why do we want to include those people? Because they probably can't afford the drug anyway once it gets approved. <laughs> Drum roll. That's the other problem. <laughs> so, so there's a philosophical shift that needs to happen within the mindset of researchers. That is good science and it makes good business sense. And, and that was based at one of the messages from Dr. Satcher. Mm -hmm. We all need to have access to healthcare if you want us to participate in these things. Yes. 
Go ahead. Uh, good Richardson. afternoon. I'm Ruth Perot from Summit Health Institute for Research and Education and honored to be in the presence of such a distinguished panel. I happen to know all of you and honor all of you. Um, I, my question really is about who should help recruit. Um, I think that Dr. Satch, others have talked about the role of the family, certainly the role of the physician, uh, and I think there was a reference to the church. But is there a role for community organizations to help um, spread the word about the importance of, uh, of these trials? Yes, I think one of the panelists um, in the previous panel just mentioned about if you are if you're a member of a national organization or um, just any organization that you're a member of, people come in and talk about various topics at your conferences, at your week uh, monthly meetings. Have people come in and talk about clinical trials there, I think the community has to play a part. Because when I, my, my circle of influence in my family is only so big, only so big with my friends. But if the community can take a larger role, then it just be, starts to become a conversation. And it's not just segmented here, here, and here. But if more organizations are talking about this, again, it just becomes a broader conversation. I think, you know, it will require for a lot of organizations that the pharmaceutical biotech companies or organizations that have been involved in clinical trials help to train those organizations in the community and then they can be um, partners with the physician at, or the group that's doing the clinical trials and assisting and supporting the patients and, and helping to recruit. And I each, think there's a role. And each ethnic segment has those groups. Uh, Las Promotoras, the community health workers in the Latino community. Uh, you've got the National Medical Association, National Black Nurses Association, Black Pharmacists. I mean, you've got to do a search of advocacy groups, not the usual suspects, the feet on the street, boots on the ground groups that have the trust of these populations and encourage them to be a part of the effort. Last question or comment. Yes, um, I'm Reuben Warren and I work at Tuskegee. And uh, when the- Dr. Satcher was looking for you. That's, that's why I showed up. It, <laughs> Tuskegee was in the air and it floated over where I was. And so I came right over here to thank you, Dr. Christensen, and also Dr. Satcher. Um, one comment that's important, some work that we're doing in, and some of you are involved in it, raises a, a paradigm shift that I'd like to raise for your consideration. We've talked about trust and going back long before the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, not the Tuskegee syphilis study. And we always put the burden of trust on populations that have been trusting. And I would suggest, and our work is demonstrating that, that is a paradigm shift from trust to trustworthy. Trustworthy. And the research community, the funders, have to prove themselves trustworthy. And what we're trying to work through is a methodology to demonstrate your trustworthiness. It just doesn't happen in a minute. It's over time, but we don't know the elements of that. Your lived experience is giving us tremendous opportunity to make the paradigm shift. We're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. We have to participate, but we have to participate with, with thoughtfulness. And I hope we continue to have that thoughtfulness. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that's a, a great... Uh, closing for our, our session. We want to thank our panelists again. Let's give all of them a round of applause. And thank you so much for coming. Um, I don't know if Kwame st Kwame's still here. Um, Kwame and your team, you've put together a great session for us this afternoon. Let's give her a round of applause. Because I'm just showing up. <laughs> Let's give this panel another round of applause. Thank you so much. And I really want to thank Laura Nita. She's my church member. And when I told her about this, she said, I want to do it. And you don't know what she had to do to get here today. She really pressed her way through. So let's give her another round of applause and some positive energy.
because she really worked to get here to tell you her story, and it meant that much to her. Thank you, Laura Nita. So just give me a moment of personal privilege. I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people, and then I'm going to let you go. I want to acknowledge my doctor mom, Dr. Bernadine Lacey. Stand up. <laughs> This is the lady who's the brains behind the brains. <laughs> and I pet, everything I do, I run it by Dr. Mom, and she's been my mentor. She's been on my research advisory committee. She was Dr. Bernadine M. Lacey. Now she's just Dr. Mom. And I love her so much. <laughs> and I want to thank Mama Ella. Mama Ella, stand up. This is my mama, Ella. I call her, and she gives me advice, too, and she supports me. And I just want to say I love you, too. All right? And to my line sister, Tanya Moore, please stand. <laughs> stand up. Everywhere I go, she goes. And I love her, too. And to Thomas, Frederick Thomas, this is the guy who got me through undergrad. <laughs> and encouraged me to finish school. So I just want to thank you too because I couldn't, I could not have walked across that stage had it not been for you and so many pep talks that you gave me. And my big sister, Lakeitha Anderson. She supports me in everything I do and another member of Metropolitan Baptist Church. And I want to thank my wonderful staff, Ms. Tamika Wims. Please stand up. She did a lot of hard work to make this happen, and I just want to acknowledge her. And if Melissa's here, everybody's gone to another session, but I could not do what I do without them. And thank you so much for believing in this session and staying, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Happy ALC.